I'm pleased today to be with Dr. Margaret Bauman, a renowned expert, um, clinician, and researcher on developmental disabilities in children and adults with special expertise in autism. Dr. Bauman is going to uh, be discussing with us today uh, on, on the topic of neurological and developmental issues in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Dr. Bauman has uh, been involved for most of her career at the Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital and directed a superb clinic for the evaluation and care of individuals with developmental disabilities called Ladders and is currently associated with the Boston um, University School of Medicine and uh, is currently seeing patients at the Integrated Center for Child Development. I'm Marvin Natovich and I'm a staff physician at the Cleveland Clinic. The specific learning objectives for today's webinar, Dr. Bauman, uh, on the neurological issues in persons with autism uh, include first for uh, a discussion of the common neurological comorbidities that uh, are experienced by some persons with autism. Second, to discuss uh, some of the important neurological so-called red flags that uh, suggest a readily identifiable uh, genetic or metabolic basis for persons with autism. And then, based on your extensive clinical and research expertise, to end up uh, discussing what you feel are some of the uh, important clinical and clinical research needs in the field. So to begin with, Dr. Bowman, can you tell for a uh, person seeing this webinar how autism is currently defined and diagnosed, and what are some of the key differences in diagnostic criteria used in the DSM-5 compared to the uh, uh, recent and previous iteration of the DSM, the DSM-4? Okay, the DSM-4 was um, initially published in 1994, and we have been using that set of criteria since that time until the spring of 2013 when the next version came out, as you've mentioned. Uh, in the original version, uh, 1994 version, it was broken down into subcategories, which, as you know, include Asperger's syndrome, a PDD-NOS, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, uh, autism, uh, and a variety of Rett syndrome, and uh, so forth. Um, we no longer have those categories, and so we're now looking at uh, a, something now called autism spectrum disorder, and they're categorizing it as mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, it takes away from the subcategory, so we no longer have Asperger's syndrome included, for example, uh, nor do we have the PDD on OS categories. Uh, we do have now uh, the addition of uh, sensory symptoms, which had not necessarily been included as one of the things to look at last time. Uh, but the basics are really pr still pretty much there in terms of uh, impaired social skills, delayed and disordered language, repetitive behaviors, and uh, isolated areas of interest, for example. So they're pretty much the same. They're, they're described somewhat differently. And I think there are some challenges with the changes uh, in the DSM-4 versus the DSM-5. Uh, so, for example, there's a good deal of concern on the part of the parents who have had children diagnosed with PDD and OS um, as to whether or not they may fall out of this autism umbrella uh, and how that might affect services or insurance coverage and the like. Uh, there is a new category that's been added, which is called social communication disorder. And if some of the PDD children fall out of the autism umbrella and end up in the social communication disorder umbrella, uh, what does that mean for service provision and coverage of, of services from a financial point of view? So, and I think the jury is still out on a lot of that. Uh, I think the other issue is how is this going to affect uh, clinical research going forward? Uh, in the past, um, we have been, of course, making our diagnoses and, and saying, okay, we're comparing Asperger's. We're looking at Asperger population or we're looking at this population, that population. We no longer have those definitions. So going forward in terms of clinical research, how are we going to find 
what groups of children we're looking at as compared to the ones in the past. And I think that there's a good deal of concern on the research end of this as to where this is all going. But I think that, that uh, I think the jury is still out as to how this is going to could end up uh, looking like a, uh, whether this is a good thing or not a good thing, but it's it's what we're going to have to use for a while and see how it fits. Thank you. Um, for the clinicians um, who are seeing persons who might have autism, from a very practical point of view, what do you as an expert in the field feel are the major challenges in recognizing a diagnosis of autism in a very young child, say a child under three years old, and specifically, what are, from your perspective, some of the important causes of false positive diagnoses and some of the important reasons why there are false negative diagnoses? Mm -hmm. And let's go first with very young children, say under three years old, and then older children or adults who might have mm -hmm. autism. Mm -hmm. okay. And I don't think that there's any doubt that early identification makes a difference in terms of outcomes, particularly if you can get services going forward. So this is a very important issue. Uh, the upshot of the of the forum meeting is that we've got a lot more research to do, for one thing. Uh, but secondly, that uh, it's very difficult to have any firm diagnosis or even maybe a, a reasonable diagnosis under the age of 12 to 14 months of age. Uh, and large part, I think this has to do with the neurology of the brain and what neurological circuits or communication systems are set up or not set up uh, prior to that time. So for example, in typically developing children, we don't expect six-month-olds to be walking or talking, but we know that that's something that develops over time because that's how the brain uh, operates and develops, and eventually that, that clicks in. So I think a lot of the symptoms that the children with autism develop over time are simply uh, the, the lines of communication aren't up and running, so we really can't tell. And I think the bottom line at this point is that without some kind of biomarker, that is a blood test, a urine test, uh, some kind of a test, uh, we may not get more specific than that uh, simply because of how the brain is, is developing. At the moment, there are a number of um, uh, questionnaires that parents uh, can be asked to fill out in, the, in their uh, doctor's office. Uh, and uh, the, the American Academy of Neurology, as you know, has recommended the various screening method is beginning at 18 months of age and then repeating it at 24 months of age, which sort of addresses the, the uh, bottom line question that you're asking, you know, why do we have to do it twice? Uh, but in any case, the, some of the more common ones are what probably the most common one is what's called the MCHAT, which is the Modified Checklist uh, for Autism in Toddlers. And that probably is probably one of the more reliable ones and um, most of the, the ones that most people are, are using. There are various other measures, but I just measured, mentioned that one. Uh, but in any case, I think the, the message here is that if, an, if a parent comes in uh, concerned about their child, even if that child is eight months old, and usually the first concern, by the way, on the basis of the parent, is that he or she is not responding to their name or he acts like he's deaf. And so typically somebody goes off and gets an audiologic examination and they find out that the hearing is fine. Uh, and then usually after that, it's, it's he doesn't really respond to his name, which is kind of sort of a hearing kind of question. And you know, I think in the old days, it, it, uh, and maybe it still happens in some parts of the country, I don't know, but in those days, old days, people would say, well, you know, let's wait another six months and see how it goes, blah, blah, blah. I think that most times now people are saying, or physicians are saying, uh, if you're that concerned, let's take it another step and get him or her more evaluated in a more detailed way. The reason for the, the pulse, pulse positives, I think, are that, that there's a great deal of variability in terms of how kids develop. And there are certainly younger children who can have uh, funny flapping behavior for whatever reason or sens sensitivities who may not have that on the basis of autism. They may have it on the basis that they have a sensory processing disorder that has nothing to do with autism. Uh, or they may simply have uh, speech and language delays for other reasons. So it's, it's, it's very hard to be sure in a very young child who's moving and developing, whether this is really going to be solid or not. In terms of the false negatives, I think it rests for when, when in this particular child's brain are some of these symptoms going to come online, yes or no. And it, this is a very heterogeneous group of, of children and individuals, as we've begun to realize. So there's a, it's a very trite 
comment now that's made that almost everybody quotes is you've seen one child with autism, you've seen one child with autism. There's not there's some commonalities to them, but they develop differently. They have different patterns of behaviors and so forth. So uh, it, it's it's very difficult, I think, to wrap your head around this. You can't be absolutely certain beyond a reasonable doubt that this child's going to be autism until autistic until around uh, 32, 34, 36 months of age. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to wait till three years of age to treat somebody. We shouldn't. Uh, we should be, have enough suspicion early on to get that child into services so that hopefully we won't be having this conversation by the time it gets to be three, four, or five years of age. Uh, but I think that the research says that we cannot be absolutely certain until much till almost three years of age. I would imagine with your years of clinical practice that sometimes there have been referrals to you of older children or even adults for whom mm -hmm. there's a question whether or not that particular individual may have a form of autism. In those instances, what were some of the challenges facing the primary care physicians uh, as to why they were or were not able to arrive at a diagnosis, and what were the challenges you experienced? A lot of these children do still have trouble with certain kinds of uh, abstract concepts, uh, trouble with picking up on social cues very well, knowing how their behavior affects others, uh, for example. And it isn't, it isn't until that sort of starts to kick in that people then start asking, well, why is this happening and is this a little bit unusual? And does this child have, I mean, does this child have some psychiatric problem when in fact that's not what's really going on here? So I think, I think it's that some of them are very bright. Um, they uh, mask some of their behaviors because their interests uh, they're getting along okay, and uh, nobody has seen this as a, as a huge problem. So clearly there are persons with autism who have normal, if not above normal, mm -hmm. intelligence. Mm -hmm. When I was going to medical school, mm -hmm. which wasn't all that long ago, um, I'd like to believe, um, <laughs> uh, the general notion of autism was that uh, persons along the autism spectrum had subnormal intellectual mm -hmm. capabilities. Can you comment on the concept of intelligence or the notion of intelligence in persons with autism and what is fact and what is not fact? Again, I, I'm not sure we've got all the answers on that, uh, quite honestly. Yes, when I was in medical school too, which was probably in the dark ages as well, um, uh, it was said something like 75% of the individuals with autism were mentally retarded. That was just sort of common lore, and I don't know that anybody ever found out where that number came from. Um, uh, I know there were studies looking for that, but I don't know that where that was ever written. It was, it was just kind of common lore. What's been interesting, I think, is with the advent of communication devices, uh, the iPad and a whole host of uh, voice output systems and whatever, it's become very clear that that is a terrible number. Uh, that once you give some of these nonverbal children, and they're probably, it's been estimated that probably about 50% or around 50% of individuals on the autism spectrum are nonverbal or hypoverbal or can't communicate their wants and needs very well. Um, so that's a substantial proportion. So if you give many of those children, adolescents, and adults some means of, of communication, a voice, so to speak, suddenly you discover that they've got all kinds of information in there. Just because they're not talking to me doesn't mean they're not getting it. And so I've become very cautious about what I say in front of even very young children because they may be getting it all. And frequently when I will say to uh, families, how much do you think your child understands? And the parent, uh, most of the time, the parent will say, I think he understands most of what I say. Now, I, I will tell you quite honestly, in the, the old days, I'd sort of blow that off and say, oh, yeah, sure, well, it's just the mother and she just thinks that this kid gets it all when it really he doesn't. I think they're absolutely right, and I think we need to do better in terms of listening to what parents' gut feelings are about their child. And I, th I think we're doing better with that, by the way. But getting back to the intelligence thing, I mean, it's not uncommon for me to get a story about a little boy. In fact, I had a little boy who, was, I've got two little stories here. One was a little boy who goes to a, a special school that, uh, outside of Boston. And uh, he is a nonverbal child, and I've seen him several times. And then I get a call from the school system, or maybe it was some parent, I don't know. But there's something like they've discovered that so-and-so is a mathematical genius. Well, the reason they figured that out was because he was using a computer with a touch screen, and they would put up some problems for him, and they would put it on there, and every blasted time he could figure the whole thing out. So he was probably six or seven years old, and he was doing sort of higher-order math 
uh, how the heck he taught it. I don't know where he got it from. Nobody sat down and taught it to him. He just kind of got it. In terms of, so, called, so to speak, classic neurological dysfunctions or disabilities, mm -hmm. there's a variety of neurological comorbidities that have been said to occur uh, in persons with autism, some perhaps more commonly than in the general population. I'd like to break these down into different subcategories, if that's okay, beginning with different types of uh, motor dysfunction. Um, what are the different types of motor dysfunction that can be experienced by persons with autism, say at different ages, whether it's a toddler or a young child or an adult? How many hours do you have? <laughs> uh, okay. And maybe you can comment on the ones that in your clinical okay. experience are most sure. important for uh, general practitioners to be familiar sure. with okay. and to know when to refer and who to refer to. Okay. Okay. I think that this is great. There's a great deal of variability here, and I don't know that anybody thinks that there's a common thread in terms of motor difficulties. I think the more Excuse me. The more common one would be hypotonia or low muscle tone. That these children are, are I don't want to say they're wet noodles, but they're a little bit looser than most typically developing children. And I think that's a fairly common finding, uh, regardless of age. Mostly in the younger kids, and it certainly gets better as you get older. But uh, it's it's fairly common. Uh, we had the uh, privilege of being part of a study uh, where we were looking at uh, younger siblings of autistic children. And our original study was to look at communication and social skills. And as we started to look at these babies beginning at six months of age, uh, we realized that some of them had odd motor patterns. Uh, and so we recruited an occupational therapist to be part of our study. And ultimately, a paper came out of that. Uh, the first author is Joanne Flanagan, who is, in fact, an occupational therapist at Hopkins. And the upshot of the study was that um, these, these babies still had what was called head lag at six months of age, uh, which is this is a sign, a developmental sign that should be gone by four months a little ill in, in typically developing kids. And here were these younger children who had them uh, at six months of age. And many of those went on, the head lag kids went on to be uh, on the autism spectrum. And so we were seeing this as a potential marker that most primary care physicians could do fairly easily in their in their clinical practice. Uh, and for those people who don't remember what head lag is, it's when you have the baby lying on the, on the cot and you take their arms and you pull them to a sit and their head kind of drags up and then finally you get to the upright position and the head comes up and then it flops forward again. So they don't have good head control. And that really should be pretty solid by, the, by four months. And we still had these babies at six months that were, weren't that good at it. So I think that this is a fairly simple sign that somebody uh, should, could, should, could do in their office uh, that doesn't take any time. You just pull the baby to the sit and you're going to see it or you're not going to see it kind of thing. That doesn't mean that every child who walks into an office, who doesn't walk, comes into an office, um, who has head lag is going to be autistic by any means. Okay, sure. uh, there could be a variety of other reasons why that is. But I think if one sees this in a younger sibling of an autistic child, this is a child who really merits very careful ongoing monitoring. So I, th I think that probably, in my view, is one of the more obvious things that we need to look at. And quite honestly, um, parents who have a second child are pin on pins and needles no matter what because they know there's a substantial risk factor that a subsequent child may be on the autism spectrum uh, at somewhere. And so they're constantly watching that baby. So if they even see that there's anything that looks odd, most of us are going to get to see that child. And most of us would ask to see the child anyway just to her for preventive purposes, I think. In terms of other motor issues, um, sometimes there is a subset of children who are delayed in rolling over or don't roll over. Uh, so they delayed or don't crawl, uh, who are delayed in terms of walking independently. Um, and those are some of the kids that we worry about for other reasons. Uh, so who have um, odd ways of, have, you know, odd movements of flapping, stereotypic movements of one sort of the other. Uh, and we also have children who um, just have trouble figuring out how to do the ordinary things that kids do. So what we call motor planning problems. How do I get my body to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it kind of thing. So this could affect feeding. It can affect um, learning to dress yourself, um, tie shoes, some of those fine motor, gross motor things. They tend, a lot of the children also don't tend to be 
terribly athletic. That having been said, there are some wonderful uh, kids who are. I think sometimes it's overwhelming for them to see a whole soccer field. I think they can participate in that as long as it doesn't get too competitive. Uh, but I think, uh, they, generally speaking, they do better in individual sports like swimming, karate, skiing, skating. I've had kids do fencing, tennis. Uh, and then later on, they could become part of a team later on, but as long as they're competing against themselves. Uh, but it, I, I don't know that there's anything specific that you could put your finger on, but I think there are motor difficulties that they do have. And in the literature, Dr. Bauman, you often find reference to um, terms such as repetitive motor movements mm -hmm. or stereotypies. Mm -hmm. Could you explain for the viewers of our conversation what those terms mean and what their possible significances are for you as an expert in the field? Okay, well we're supposed to be talking about neurological issues and I guess to some extent maybe some of these are neurological. So there's you know the flapping behavior the kids do, they can be twirling something, they can be flicking their hair, they, anything that's repetitive that doesn't seem to have any sort of purpose to it. Uh, oftentimes the, the parents will tell you that it seems to be calming for the child to do, do something. Uh, one of the biggest complaints though is that this, these behaviors tend to separate them from their peers, that they are odd enough that people, other kids start picking up on the fact that the, there's something different about this child. And so we will sometimes try to get a behaviorist uh, to help us get rid of the behaviors. I don't think you can, with the behavioral people, I think they're right, you can't really get rid of it, but could you replace it with something that's more socially acceptable, which is what we sort of try to do. If you're, you're, if you're flicking something, can you have something you hold in your hand that nobody really notices quite so much? And, and I guess in some ways, all, many of us have things that we do that are repetitive, so you know, people could sit and twist their hair while they're thinking about something, for example. Nobody gets too upset about that, but you know, could we teach some of the kids to do that? for example. So it could be anything, anything that's a routine that doesn't seem to be functional, I guess, that, they, that the kids just kind of, kind of do over time. Now having said that, uh, I think we've, a lot of us have seen this as a sensory processing problems. Somehow the occupational therapists get involved in it and sometimes when we can give good occupational therapy, some of that will diminish over time. Uh, but it's also become apparent to me uh, that some of this can be a marker for an underlying medical condition. And I will tell you just a brief story uh, of a little boy that I think he was nine years old at the time who had repetitive head hitting behavior. And first of all, people said, well, it must be because he has a headache. Well, he's a nonverbal child. He can't tell us he's got a headache. And so what is this? So we've tried a variety of medications. We tried behavior management and a whole host of things. And none of that seemed to help. And it was just this very repetitive, head-hitting kind of stereotype that sort of thing. Anyway, some, somewhere along the line, I sent this child to the gastroenterologist with whom I work because I'd come to the conclusion that any child who shows me odd behavior that I can't figure out deserves a trip to the gastroenterologist <laughs> at that point. So anyway, then I didn't see him for a long time. And about a year later, I went out into the waiting room with, and the gastroenterologist happened to be with me. And I see this little boy sitting there. And I, I said to the GI guy, gee, you know, that kid looks so familiar. I mean, so who is the child? He says, oh, you remember that kid that used to come and hit his head all the time, blah, blah, blah. He said, I did an endoscopy and a colonoscopy. He had colitis. I treated his colitis, and he hasn't done it since. Uh, but I've now keyed into the fact that some of these behaviors may not just be part of the autism, that it may be something else that it's trying to tell us, and that we really need to think more broadly about what some of these behaviors may be telling us. And uh, just because I'm a neurologist doesn't mean I should think just about neurology. I should think well beyond my specialty or I need help to think beyond my specialty. And this was certainly a classic case of that. Um, when one reads reviews about neurological uh, comorbidities in autism, mm -hmm. one of the um, uh, families of neurological conditions that's always mentioned is um, the um, uh, finding of epilepsy mm -hmm. in some children and some adults with autism. Uh, based on your experience and your reading of the studies in the literature, um, how often is, does epilepsy occur in persons with autism? Is there any age relatedness of the epilepsy onset? Are there any specific forms or types of epilepsy that are more common in persons with autism? 
Are there any types of epilepsy that may not be common, but immediately send your mind into thinking about specific metabolic or genetic types of conditions? Okay, well, first of all, I think the literature says that there's no one specific kind of seizure disorder or epilepsy that, that's common in this disorder. I think that for the most part, most of us see what's called complex partial seizures or what used to be called temporal lobe seizures uh, probably as a more common kind of epilepsy, but the literature suggests that it could be anything. Um, the, the, the complex partial seizures perhaps are a little more challenging because it, Oftentimes, the, the children are not having the grand mal seizures that people think about as seizure seizures, so they're not necessarily falling on the floor, shaking all over, and so forth, but they may have funny facial movements, they may stare off into space, they may not be responsive, uh, they may um, have uh, what fainting episodes of some kind, what sometimes I mean, people uh, interpret as um, syncopal attacks, for example. Uh, there can be a whole host of sort of odd behaviors that people, or even some of the repetitive behaviors that we've already talked about. So are you saying that in those children or adults with autism who have an underlying complex partial seizure disorder, that that seizure disorder can sometimes be misinterpreted as autistic behavior? Yes, yes, uh, I, absolutely. And I think it, it's very challenging. I think the parents think about seizures a lot. Teachers think about seizures a lot, particularly if they see something they don't fully understand. So it's not uncommon for a child to come to the office and somebody says, well, this behavior is occurring and somebody has thought about seizures. Uh, I think that at least in, in my practice that seems to happen. I suspect sometimes other people can see this just as autism. But most, somehow most parents are pretty aware that there could be a seizure problem here and they're Want, you know, is this something we could, could, should do to take care of this problem, sort of the question. Uh, we can do EEGs. Uh, EEGs are not infallible. Uh, so we can have a child who has a, a, clearly has a major seizure disorder, but can have a perfectly normal EEG or one that's not very telling, frankly. And it may be because the focus of the seizure is too far in deep in the brain and it can't be picked up by the surface electrodes that we're seeing uh, there. Or we can have somebody who uh, doesn't have seizures at all, never has seizures, never going to have seizures, who has a funny looking EEG or anything in between. So it's, it is challenging to try to make this kind of diagnosis. Uh, the going statistics that everybody quotes are, you know, 33 percent or some third of the individuals on the autism spectrum, regardless of age, sometime in their life are going to have, have seizures. I think that the younger children, I've seen mostly things like 9%, 12%, and so forth. The, I think the high-risk periods are rather similar to what we see in typically developing non-autistic kids. So we're talking about the zero to five-year age group, which has a lot of uh, feb what are called febrile seizures, where you get a seizure with a fever. A lot of those are considered relatively benign. Uh, and then you get the adolescent years where people have hypothesized that hormonal changes are kicking in and causing more seizures. Uh, we do see adults, young adults, who develop their seizures at 18, 19 years of age. Uh, those tend to be ones that they have for the, almost the rest of their lives kind of thing, but not necessarily so. I think that the sense is that if you have a child who's been treated and has a seizure disorder and you've successfully treated it, that being he hasn't had a seizure for two plus years, that maybe you can try to cut back on the medication to see if this is going away. There have been two, several large studies done on not children with autism per se, but uh, children who with seizures, and their estimate was that 85% of children who have seizures in a lifetime uh, will outgrow them. Uh, of course, that leaves the remaining 15%, and that didn't carve out the autism kids uh, particularly. Uh, so I think there are a subset of children who may not have this for the rest of their lives, uh, but they, you know, they're also another subset that do. And happily, I think for the large majority of children, we can control them relatively well. Uh, there still, however, are a number of children where no matter almost like what we've tried medications and vagal stimulators and a variety of other things, and still they continue to have uh, seizures that really interfere with their lives. It's, but, you know, you keep, try, keep trying to find the right combination, but sometimes we're not always successful. And can you, moving from epilepsy and movement disorders, a third area that is often discussed a lot in the literature regarding neurological comorbidities in autism is that of sleep disorders. 
Um, what are the different types of sleep disorders that have been studied in persons with autism and how much is known? Uh, I think it's a moving target at this point. There's a lot of, of work going on, particularly out of Vanderbilt with um, um, Dr. Beth Mallow, uh, who's doing some lovely work. Uh, there's a lot of work coming out of Australia with a lady named Amanda Richdale. Uh, another gentleman, Kyle Johnson in Oregon, is looking at it. There, there are a number of people who have, who have really taken this on as a, as a project, and I think it's an important project uh, because if the child's not sleeping, the rest of the family isn't sleeping, and it's very disruptive, and certainly if the child doesn't have high-quality sleep, then that interferes with his or her ability to attend during the day and so forth. So it has a lot of ramifications. You know, whether this is all sort of uh, central nervous system driven or whether there are other causes for this, I think is also one of the big questions that's being studied. Uh, sleep onset is often one of the big factors. It's a hard time for him or her to get to sleep. Uh, uh, sustaining sleep is also another one. So kids can sometimes get to sleep, but two hours later they're up and they're up for the day kind of thing. And that's really, of course, disruptive for everybody in the family. Uh, there are kids who have night terrors. There are kids who have restless leg syndrome. Uh, there are kids that do some sleepwalking kind of thing. Uh, so it's almost anything you can think of. But I think the things that people look at mostly uh, are the sleep onset and sustaining sleep are the big factors that I'm aware of. And for you, when you um, are with a child or an adult who has a form of autism who might have a sleep disorder, what are the questions you use to probe this issue with either parents or with uh, the affected individual, and what are the tools used to further evaluate the possibility of a sleep disorder and to characterize it? Well, I think you, in, in terms of the tools used, it depends it depends whether you're the, the clinician or the researcher, quite honestly, okay? So if I'm the clinician, I'm not likely to do some do or use some of the tools that the researchers are using uh, because my job is to try to immediately solve the problem or solve it as rapidly as I can. Um, so for example, uh, the researchers will use what you call the actinography. They have a little band that they wear around their wrists and this is uh, to record awakenings during the night and so forth. Uh, you can do sleep studies, so you, somebody comes into the hospital overnight and, and gets recorded using an EEG kind of thing, so one can see what rapid eye movement of REM sleep looks like, uh, so how long does it take somebody to get into sleep, uh, uh, what's the quality of the sleep that's occurring, how many times do they awaken, and so forth and so on. So you can get some of these patterns and then hopefully uh, be able to deal with it. And I think it's a very complex uh, sleep dis disorders that's warranted. I think for those of us who are in the clinical world, um, we're, we're facing a family whose child spends three hours just trying to get to sleep at night. Now, some of that may be anxiety related. So are we talking about anxiety? And you, you kind of ask about what are their usual uh, patterns when, about getting the children to settle down? Where does he sleep? Uh, what kind of a bedroom does he have? Uh, there are a number of reasons why some kids might have some sleep problems. So some, the sensory processing piece, by the way, the occupational therapists are rather interested in this because sometimes um, deep pressure, a lot of our kids like deep pressure. So some very smart parents have taken a bed, for example, and pushed it against the wall so that the kids will cuddle up next to the wall and that gives them enough pressure or using a weighted blanket. Or I've heard about lycra pajamas, uh, something that really makes them sort of warm and cozy, I guess. Uh, and sometimes that's fairly simple to do. Uh, we've used um, melatonin. There's a lot of work now being done in melatonin in this disorder, and that can be quite effective. Quite often it's an over-the-counter story, and you can go and get uh, melatonin in various doses. We really try to start very low at like a milligram, maybe up to three milligrams, but the data says you can go up as high as eight milligrams, and maybe some people are going higher than that, and to give that about 20 or 30 minutes before bedtime, and that's been quite effective in a lot of children. Um, some people have used clonidine as a medication. Some people have used trazodone as a, a medication for sleep onset. So there are a number of things that people have tried to do in terms of sleep onset. The problem about sustaining sleep is much more challenging. Uh, at least in my experience, the melatonin helps you get to sleep. It doesn't keep you asleep. So how do you manage all of that? Uh, we also think about other medical conditions. I mean, I, I don't, while the, the consensus is that this has something to do with arousal and circadian rhythm, which has central nervous system implications, 
There are kids who have gastroesophageal reflux disease, for example, who, when you lie down, the acids from your stomach slither up into your esophagus and into the back of your throat, and they keep you awake, for example. Or there could be other GI pieces, or you could have big tonsils and adenoids, so you can't breathe and you're snoring, and if you can't breathe, you can't sleep very well. So there could be other medical conditions, and so I really ask a lot of questions about uh, other medical conditions. And sometimes the children can't tell you, and you have to guess, and sometimes if I have a child with sleep disorders, I may well refer them to the gastroenterologist, just on the basis that they're having significant sleep problems that haven't responded to the usual measures. So I think it's, it's a, not a simple question at all. It's, and again, it's one of those questions where you really have to think out of the box and, and involve your other specialty colleagues. And um, as someone who's been involved in the uh, care of persons uh, with autism for many years and has also done a lot of research, I'd like to end our discussion with two questions. Um, what do you, as an expert in the field, feel are very important challenges for uh, clinicians and the clinical infrastructure in the neurological and developmental care of children and adults with autism? And what do you as a researcher feel are the pressing areas for additional clinical research regarding developmental and neurological concerns in persons with autism? Okay. Um, I think from, from the clinical perspective, just in terms of, of care of children, adolescents, and adults, uh, first of all, um, my bias is to assume competence uh, right from the start, unless proven otherwise. So to Competence in the individual yes. who's the, uh, yes. the, the autistic of evaluation. Yes, yes. And be it a child, an adolescent, or an adult, or whatever it is. Um, uh, that may may not turn out to be so, but I think that uh, making the assumption that this child can't do whatever it is that they can't do uh, just because they've got some neurologic impairment, I think is is short sighted. And I think as more technology and comes on board, we're going to have we're going to find that out. I mean, in the old days. Uh, we used to think that all people with cerebral palsy were retarded, and then we gave people technologies to find out that, guess what, they're not. Uh, so I think it's sort of... That's a gonna, powerful example. Yes, and so um, I think we're, we're slow to come to that in autism, I, I'm, I'm afraid, but I think it's becoming a little more apparent now that we've given people devices and, and given them a voice. So I think that, to me, that's, that's huge. Um, I think that it would be lovely if, in terms of the overall picture, if we could come up with some biomarkers that would help us with diagnosis, um, particularly if we could do prenatal, early neonatal uh, diagnoses kind of stories. I don't know how realistic that is. I don't know if there's going to be a, in fact, I'm pretty sure there is not going to be a single biomarker. I think this is as now people have come to realize this is heterogeneous, I think there are multiple ways that... You mean etiologically heterogeneous? Yes, yes. I think it's causative. It come, you come to it different ways. That means that your neurobiology is probably going to be different. Uh, it means your clinical expression is going to be different. Uh, and we, I think one of the things my fondest wish is that we really start looking at subgroups or subsets. You know, who, for example, we've talked a little bit about the gastrointestinal groups. Uh, is that a subset? Is that part of a subset? There's some work done by um, Dr. Pat Levitt, who's now at USC, looking at what's called the MET gene. Um, and uh, there does seem to be a, a subset of individuals on the autism spectrum who are positive for the MET gene who ha are both GI and autistic. Uh, and is that, is that trying to tell us something? And uh, are there other disorders that we need to start thinking about that will allow us to look at subsets, which then could hopefully talk about the underlying neurobiologies, which then could, of course, give us potentially a biomarker down the line, and then we could talk about specific treatments for specific groups. Uh, again, a, another example of something like that is, I mean, is cancer, frankly. I mean, the cancer of the ovary is not the same as cancer of the lung, is not the same as you know, brain cancer. There are all lots of different kinds of cancers. Uh, I mean, it's not quite the same model, but I mean, just thinking more broadly, maybe there, we need to start looking at subgroups. Uh, I think in terms of the transition age uh, folks, um, 
I think people have finally gotten the message that we need to do better about the the older teens and young adults, uh, and not simply putting them in you know covered workshops to do stuff envelopes or whatever it is that they do there. I have a, a gentleman who's 44 years old who I see for a sleep disorder, um, and he comes with his. He's nonverbal. He communicates on a device, and uh, he. Um, it's an amazing guy. But anyway, he, one of our visits, he comes in and tells me he's bored in his day program, okay? And I, I said, uh, you know, trying to be helpful, I said, oh, well, do you want to, what kinds of things would you like to do? Do you want to uh, work with the animals? Do you want to work with children? Do you want to work outside? Do you want to work inside, blah, blah, And he types in, uh, you are not my vocational advisor. I came here to discuss my medical concerns. <laughs> At which point I thought, oh, okay. Uh, so the next time he comes back in and I said, well, you know, the last time you were here, we were talking about your your jobs. How are things going? And he types in, I have trouble with rage. And I said, oh, really? I said, what makes you angry? And he types in, when people ask me to do things I don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I started to laugh and I said, so-and-so, you need a maid, and he types in. Do you have any referrals? <laughs> so, so, so uh, I think we. I mean, I'm, this is clearly a very bright guy uh, who needs to be doing something than sitting around doing something fairly routine in a in a workshop somewhere. And I think that people are getting better at finding good jobs for these folks. I have one young man who uh, our conversation usually is, Dr. Bowman, do you have an Electrolux? Um, and uh, if I come clean your house, can I have a diet Dr. Pepper? Those are our two conversations. And when he turned 21, 22, he got a very good case manager who found him a job at one of the Marriott hotels outside of Boston. And he is the best vacuum cleaner you can possibly imagine. He got to be uh, the employee of the month twice. There is a YouTube video out now called uh, Autism Coming of Age, and he is the middle person that's highlighted in that. And they've clearly taught him that he can't barge into a room. Uh, so he shows him, and he knocks on the door of this room, and he says, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then he knocks again. And he goes in, and they show him vacuuming. And I've never seen anybody vacuum a lampshade before, but this guy's vacuuming the lampshade. And I'm sure that he is one of the best vacuumers. He, he's now in his early 30s, and he's permanently employed. Loves to do this, you know, collects vacuum cleaners as a hobby, apparently. Um, and he's, go, he's happy as a clam. I mean, this is what he ought to be doing. So I think we need to be a little bit more creative about um, finding employment that's meaningful for a lot of these young people who I think have a lot of abilities. They may not be what we, you and I would think of as the most fun thing to do in the world, but that's what they want to do. So I'd like to see that happen. I'd like to see better school programs for these kids where it's not a one-size-fits-all. And, and again, I think this depends upon where you live. I think there are certain communities that are doing a really good job, and there are some communities that are not doing such a very good job. And uh, some of the communities that are not doing a very good job are those that just say, well, we have a program for autism. And you know, if the child doesn't fit in, well, then it, there must be something wrong with him. The concept that you might have to teach this child a little bit differently than that child simply isn't on the radar screen. And I realize that that's costly. Uh, but I think I, I think it's doable, and I think certain communities have figured out how to do it. And I think we need to help our school systems, uh, particularly if our, our prevalence numbers are as even half of what people are talking about. School systems are, are going to have to figure this out, because it, you know just doing the same old same old isn't going to work anymore. And in addition to the clinical and educational needs that you've just identified, um, as a researcher, what do you feel are the uh, paramount clinical research needs, especially with respect to neurological comorbidities? Um, well, I, I really guess I guess I'm going back to the, the basic neurobiology behind this story um, more than the clinical piece that you're referring to. Um, I think in terms of the clinical piece, I, my personal bias is that we need to look at our our other specialty colleagues to help us understand the neurobiology of this disorder. So for example, I talked a lot about GI this time. Uh, a lot of the neurotransmitters, in fact, most of the neurotransmitters that are in the brain are also in the gut. Serotonin, which is a big um, red flag in, in autism, is generated in the gut. So can we learn from our gastrointestinal colleagues uh, about the neurobiology of this disorder? This is not 
I think, just a brain problem. I think it's a more general problem in many cases. And I think other, other colleagues have a lot more to tell us than we've tapped into. Uh, certainly the metabolic, medical genetics piece, I think, have a lot to tell us. And one of the things I, I really think that the genetics and metabolic people need to do better at um, is uh, defining clinical descriptions of who the people are they're talking about. So we've got huge genetic studies out there that are talking about we found this high candidate gene risk factor for autism. But I don't personally, as a clinician, have a clue in the world what that's going to show me or tell me about the clinical presentation of this child. Uh, how do I know that this is different from that one over there or whatever this is? And I, I think we've done a poor job of that. I think likewise in terms of the neuroanatomy work that we've been doing. Um, we get these post-mortem cases, but we don't have a lot of data on, we try to get as much data as we can in terms of educational records, um, medical records, and so forth to figure out who these kids are and the brains that we're looking at. But we see a lot of variation under the microscope on these brains. And we don't really have the detailed clinical information to know what that really means. We're making generalities out of what we hope is information that we have. But simply knowing that this child meets criteria for autism on the ADI or the ADOS is no longer helpful. You know, we really need to know what's his medical condition, what, you know, what was his speech and language like, what was his motor condition like, da 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 da. And that detail is simply not there. And I think you know, the geneticist, anybody who's looking at the underlying medical anything needs to have that very detailed piece of information and it just isn't always there. So I would really, I think that's gonna be a, a huge piece of it. But I think also involving our colleagues are really important. I know that that doesn't answer the question vis-a-vis -vis the seizures, but I think it kind of does, as a matter of fact. I think that this is tied in. Same way the motor pieces, um, any of the other, what you and I would think of as neurology. I think it's, it's too isolating to just call it just neurology. We've gotta think more broadly. Thank you very much for sharing your insights with all of us.